Once again, good evening to our virtual Wednesday night Bible study. Church family, guests, we're so glad to have you tonight because this is our way of trying to share the Word of God on a Wednesday night venue. We used to come to the church. We'll in the future do that again to the building and have our classes and our devotional. But in the meantime, this is a way that we can have our Wednesday night worship experience. Tonight, we'll be listening to Michael Beck as he gives us a devotional on the new life. And then I want to follow after the song by Derek with a devotional dealing with the questions our children have about worship. So tonight's going to be an all out way of trying to study God's word, sing praises to him, enjoy this worship experience together. Let's now enjoy Michael as he shares with us a new life. Good evening. Tonight we would like to take a look together at the eternal life and the hope that we have in it. Uh, and we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. So I would encourage you to follow along in your Bibles. Open it to Colossians chapter 3 and we'll be looking at the first 17 verses. You all know that a baby in the womb does not know anything except what's in the womb. And uh, this is a very uh, similar um, metaphor for what we are like when we look at the heaven that we are looking forward to. Uh, a baby does know that it has life and a baby does not does even know that the, the mother loves it. But other than that, it has no clue of the life that comes after birth. The baby is confined to a tiny space uh, and he or she can't uh, even fathom the enormous space, the whole world that will be available to it after leaving the mother's belly. It really only knows darkness at this point. It doesn't really know all the beauty of nature and the radiance of a sunset or the beautiful smiles of family and loved ones. Uh, it can't see anything that, like that yet. Life outside the womb also comes with many dangers and also rewards, many rules as well as expectations. How could a mother possibly prepare an unborn baby for the world that is about to enter? And obviously it can't be done until the baby is born, can you t start teaching the baby? So when the baby enters the world, it is pretty much unprepared. Now, comparing this with us Christians getting ready for heaven, we have an advantage, and that is that God does prepare us for the heavenly life. Now, our brains are still not able to fathom what heaven is going to be like, what it's going to look like, um, the glory and everything. Uh, yet, we have some practical advice on to get ready for the life that we are facing in eternity in heaven with God. So unlike, unlike the example of the baby, does, uh, God does prepare us and heaven will be inf infinitely greater than earth and will be require us to follow new rules and expectations that we need to learn. Although we haven't entered heaven yet, we are already born into the new life when we were baptized. And God prepares us and teaches us the new rules of the heavenly life while we are still here on earth. He does so by teaching us through the Bible. That is one of the reasons that God has given us the Bible. And now let's open up Colossians 3, 1 through 17, which will get us ready to the eternal life. Let's start with verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So this is telling us that we need to focus on what is most important. And what is most important? That's eternal life in heaven. Because our life down here is really very short. It is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Uh, that's what James wrote. Um, and Christ is our life. Uh, 
that we can see also in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And these verses also tell us that when we are with Christ, we are in his glory. 1 Corinthians 15, 43 um, emphasizes this as well, where it reads uh, about the, our life, that it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. So when we are baptized, we get to partake in his glory. Now let's look at the next verses 5 through 9, which tell us while we are uh, we transition into Christ, into his glory, there are some things we need to stop doing, and it's teaching us what is not going to be acceptable in heaven. So we need to start now to learn, stop doing these things. I'm going to read verses 5 through 9, and then we look at them separately. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. So the first one mentioned was fornication, and that is sexual sin. The next one was uncleanness, which is doing pretty much anything immoral. We are not to be defiled. We are washed clean by the blood of Jesus, and we need to do our best to stay clean. And these things just aren't acceptable anymore when we are in heaven. Then passion was mentioned. And there's good passion and there's bad passion. What is this is referring to, obviously, is passions that control us, sinful passions that pull us away from God. Then evil desires wanting things, things that aren't good for us, sinful things, wanting more stuff, things that distract us. Next was covetousness, uh, which is an idol idolatry. Also mentioned then later on was anger. And there is there's anger, which is okay. Jesus got angry too at the money changers in the temple. Uh, the the um, people that blasphemed against God, he got angry with the Pharisees a lot of times. So that is that is okay and acceptable, was modeled by Christ, that we are ang angry against sinful behavior. But outside of that, angry being angry with somebody is not a good thing. We should not do, do that. We should try to avoid that. Then wrath. Wrath means losing your temper. We should be even-tempered. We should be not easy to get angry. We should not lose our temper and get into fights. Another thing for us to stop doing is malice, being malicious, being hurtful towards others. Also blasphemy, speaking against God, uh, speaking against the Bible. Using filthy language also, saying shameful things that are just not acceptable to Christians that put us, us and God in a bad light. When people know that we are Christians, they will expect us to talk in a way that is uh, not, not shameful. Also, we cannot be liars. That is mentioned over and over throughout the Bible, that there's no place for liars in heaven, so we need to stop lying. And then it says at the end that um, of these verses, that Christians are said to have put off the old man with his deeds. Again, a reminder that we are new people in Christ and we need to cast these things off. Now, verses 10 through the first part of verse 12 are sort of a transition. And it reads, And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave of no three, free, but Christ is all and in is Christ is all and in all. 
So this transitions us into the character of the new man. Uh, we are told that once we are made new through baptism, we have renewed knowledge, and the knowledge comes through the Bible. So that is uh, uh, something we need to take to heart, that we study the Bible. We realize we are created in his image. Genesis 127 tells us that God created us in his image. Christ opened his arms for everyone. We are all welcome, whether we're slave or free, whether we're Jew or not Jew, circumcised or not, it doesn't matter. It's open for us all. And we are the elect of God, his adopted children. John 1.12 tells us the same thing. Uh, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So now what are the things we are to do then? What is God teaching us we need to be doing so that we can get ready for heaven? The second half of verse 12 through the end of verse 17 tells us about this. And it says, uh, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The attributes that follow are not a work we must do to be allowed to remain in Christ, but rather attributes we will naturally develop and receive if we truly love and follow Christ. And the attributes here are tender mercies, which means to forgive others even if they don't seem to deserve it, kindness, being kind and friendly, having humility, being humble, that means to focus on others rather than on yourself, having meekness, gentleness, being mild, long-suffering, which is patience, Verse 13, we have another emphasis on mercy. We need to forgive us others because Christ forgave all of us and we need to model him. Verse 14 says that the most important thing is love. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, uh, also tells us the same thing. Where... Uh, Christ tells us that everything focuses on love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So it's all about love. Verse 14, 15 tells us to let peace rule in you. That means to be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. And to be thankful, everything we have and everything we are is thanks to God. We need to remember that. Verse 16 tells us to read and study and memorize God's word. Um, and if you do that, you'll be so glad in your heart that you actually want to sing, sing the words. You want to sing out to God. And then verse 17 uh, reminds us that the new focus is Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. Now, in conclusion, we have seen that we are, uh, we have a new life that we are preparing for in heaven, and we have things that we need to learn about this so that we can be ready for it. Things that we need to stop doing, things that we need to start doing so we can learn for that. Do you expect to go to heaven one day? If so, you would do, you would do well to prepare for it to receive the God's teachings from the Bible with an open heart. Learn as much as you can and transform your life. If you're not sure or you don't think you will go to heaven, I urge you to consider to take the necessary steps, which are to, to hear God's word, to believe, to confess Jesus, to repent of your sins, 
and to be baptized by submersion in water. We are about to uh, sing a song of invitation. If there's anything we can do for you, to pray for you or to study with you, uh, please come forward and let us know as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Let's sing 892, The Steadfast Love of the Lord. 892. The steadfast love of the, the Lord, never, the Lord ceases. never ceases. His mercies never, His come, mercies to never an end. come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. The steadfast love the of the steadfast Lord, love never, the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come His to an end. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in him. Once again, good evening, church family, and good evening to all of our guests. If you enjoyed this wonderful devotional that Michael gave us and singing praises to God with Derek, and now we go into our Bible study for tonight. Last time we were together, we talked about the idea of heaven. Children ask about heaven. They ask about why we go to church. They ask about worship. We put all those three questions together last time and went to Revelation chapter 4. And the Revelation showed us about worship in heaven. And we realized the wonderful glory that's involved in worshiping him. Tonight, I want to look at more about worship on how to worship God. A lot of people are confused and do different things, but the Bible tells us that when Jesus was asked about where and how to worship God correctly, Je Jesus responded in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit, the right kind of attitude. Paul said, I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. I will pray in the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding also. He's talking about having the spiritual attitude of worship. And then in truth means in the actions that we do according to God's Word, because truth is the Word of God. John 17, 17, thy Word is truth. Doing it God's way, God's word, God's will. A great example of this, and tonight we're going to do this for our devotional for our children. In fact, as I finish tonight, we won't take the whole hour up tonight in our worship. You might take the minutes available to you and go over this again with your children. See if they got it. Any questions about it? Be a wonderful devotion for you tonight, even after this is over with. But when we look at worship, the very first two individuals in the Bible that worship God, Genesis chapter 4. Turn to Genesis chapter 4, and you're going to look at these first two births on the earth, Cain and Abel. These siblings, these brothers, came to worship God. The Bible tells us that Cain was a tiller of the ground, a very wonderful profession. And Abel was a shepherd of the field, a wonderful profession. And when they came to worship God, they came from what they were about. Uh, Cain brought the fruit of the field. And Abel brought of his flock to the Lord. It may be surprising when you read this to your children, that God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain. Well, why not? Weren't they both sincere in bringing what they had? We wouldn't know from that text. That's why God gave us the rest of the story in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. 
by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which God bore witness that he was righteous, that that was the kind of gift that he had asked for. And even though Abel was killed on that occasion, his life, his actions speak to us today. So what do we have here? We have here that God has a way to be worshipped. Cain did not do it by faith. Cain did it Cain's way. In Jude verse 11, it says, do not go the way of Cain. Cain's way is my way. I'm going to do it my way. This world is full of people. They're all about doing anything and everything, including worship. My way, what I like. Yet God says we're to do it his way, what he likes. It's done by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Since Abel's was by faith, he did what God said. And that's why he was accepted. And actually, God told Cain that in Genesis 4. He says, Cain, verse 7, if you do well, won't you be accepted? And the answer is yes. To do well is do it God's way. But if you don't do well, if you do it your way, then sin, like Satan, the roaring lion, is at the door of your heart, ready to pounce upon you. But you can and must control it. But Cain didn't. Rather than repenting, he took it out on his brother and killed him. And then when God said to him, where's your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, he is. We all are our brother's keeper. And he had to go out and become a wanderer the rest of his life. The ground that he tilled now was cursed by him because of the blood of his brother. And he said, I can't bear this and someone will try to kill me. And he said, I'll put a mark on you so they will not. But the consequences were terrible for Cain. There are consequences to our sins. Sin is breaking God's law, doing what God said not to do. And so in this example, we see faith worshiping. Now young people are going to ask you, well, are we doing it right at church? Great question. Are we doing it right? We saw last week that they sing before God upon the throne. Our prayers come before God, Revelation tells us, chapter 8. The Bible says that the word will be there. Christ is the word. So when we come to earth, we ask ourselves, what do we do to worship God according to his will? The Bible says sing. In fact, the whole book of Psalms is songs to God. But how are we supposed to sing? So we ask your children, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians 5.19. Ephesians 5.19. Ephesians is the book about the church. Remember our themes of each book of the Bible? The Church of Christ. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. We're told to sing and make the melody, not with an H-A-R-P, but with an H-E-A-R-T, with our hearts. You can go to many churches and see all kinds of instruments of music, from a piano, an organ, to a whole band. There was a man who grew up in that kind of atmosphere, and then at that time, they just had the piano in that assembly, and the people there wanted to bring in a whole band. And he said, no, that's not right. And trying to prove that that band was wrong, he came to realize that even the piano was wrong. That we're supposed to make the melody in our hearts to the Lord. Is that important? That's the way God commanded it. This is doing it God's way. Let's turn to Colossians, two more books over, the Christ of the Church, remember? Colossians 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, 
here it is again, with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We are to sing and make the melody in our hearts. Now, in the Old Testament, they had all kinds of instruments of music. Someone has said, but the instrumental music in the New Testament is deafening because there isn't any. God wants to hear our hearts. The New Testament is a better law, but one better promises. It's a heart religion as opposed to the stones of the Ten Commandments, a stone religion. We have now a heart religion and we sing from the heart. The very word a cappella, which your more known definition today is without instrument accompaniment. Someone says, you don't have any music in your church. Oh, we do. But the music is the instrument of the heart. But a cappella originally meant as they do in the churches. Look it up. In fact, you're going to find for the first 400 years after Christ's resurrection, the church establishment, even if the different churches were springing up, no one used an instrument of music until 400 years after the first century. God's way is the first century church way. To worship him in spirit and in truth. Singing. We also are to pray for one another. The Bible tells us, James 5 and verse 16, pray one for another that you might be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of righteous people avail much. In the assembly, we have men that lead us in prayer, men who lead us in singing, men who lead us in the Lord's Supper, men who lead us in preaching, and lead us even in the contribution. Why? I want you to turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's not that women can't worship in a wonderful way, and they do. But God has a way of leadership in the assembly. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, he begins with prayer, talking about how important it is, and today especially, to pray for those in authority, that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness. Then in verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What about the women? Verse 11, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer or allow not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. They're to be in a quiet disposition. They're not to usurp authority over the man, take over the leadership roles. Why? For Adam was first formed and Eve. We go all the way back to the very beginning of creation of man, Genesis chapter 2 and 3, actually 1, 2, and 3. He makes man in chapter 2. He puts man in the garden in chapter 3. Man sins. But man was made first. But then in verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The woman was deceived, and then she gave to Adam, and he did eat. So what's the point? God uses two examples to show that I want male leadership in the assembly, and women are to remain in the pew and listen and pray and sing and do all the acts of worship being led by male leadership. That's God's way. Another concept is the Lord's Supper. Maybe your children have asked you when they, we do the Lord's Supper, what's going on? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as they did in Matthew 26, when at first the apostles had the uh, supper in the upper room, the last supper we call it. Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body. You all eat of it. And they took the fruit of the vine, says, you all drink the fruit of the vine. This is my blood of the New Testament, shed for many for the remission of sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul reflects upon that and says, that's the Lord's Supper. Do you remember the Lord's death until he comes? But how often? In Acts 20 and verse 7, heavy children turn to that. Acts 20 and verse 7, upon the first day of the week, you look at your calendar, that's Sunday. 
the Jews worship on the Sabbath, Saturday. But we worship on the first day of the week. Why? That's the day the Lord raised from the dead. It's the Lord's day. The day the church was established, Acts chapter 2. And the church continued to worship on the first day of the week. And they came together to break bread. That's the really center of our worship. And Paul preached on that occasion. And so we have here the Lord's Supper. The unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, to remember the Lord's death till he comes upon the first day of the week. And your calendar, my calendar, it comes every week. And so we take the Lord's Supper every week. Some don't take it every week. Read your Bible. The Lord says that's what he wants, to weekly come together and partake of the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week. And we talked about Paul preaching. Preaching is a part of our worship. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, have your children turn to that. Paul says, preach, how, what? The word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Ready to preach it when it's popular, when it's not popular. Reprove, say this is the way it should be. Rebuke, if you're not doing it correctly. And exhort, you can do it right. With all patience, long suffering and gentleness. We are to preach the word in love. Preach the word as God directed. So he says in 1 Peter chapter, I think it's 2, 4, 4 and verse 11. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, or a thus saith the Lord, God's word on the matter. So you can check him out. When he's preaching, you can, he gives you book, chapter, and verse. That's how you know you're worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's how you know you're going through the actions in spirit and in truth, and even hearing the word in spirit and in truth. And then there's the giving. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul says, verses 1 and 2, as is the custom of the churches, when you come together upon the first day of the week, that's the custom, let each one of you lay by him in store what you have prospered, so there'll be no gathers when I come. When you come together for church, just have everybody bring what they've been saving, and then you give. This is what we do every first day of the week. We give if we've been prospered. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 tells us, give as you've been prospered. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God will bless us as we give to him. I hope your children are giving chores to do, and I hope they are reimbursed for that, given an allowance. And then they can take that money, and they realize that in the Old Testament, written for our learning, they gave a tenth plus. How much should I give to the church? Well, if you're given a dollar a week, then a dime goes to the Lord. If you're given ten dollars a week, a dollar goes as a tenth. Learn how to give, and then you grow from there. And some people give much more than that because they've been blessed and they realize that. And God blesses us. And it's a wonderful concept of giving to the Lord, where your treasure is, is your heart also. So now that we've talked about this, you might, after we finish tonight might even set up everything around your living room like a worship service and say, this is why we do it. This is the Bible for it. Do you have any questions about it? And raise up this generation to know. Because so many generations got to a point and said, I don't know why we do it this way. I like this way. I like that way. But God has his way. And if we know it, we can also not only practice it, but share it with others. We've learned tonight from both the Old and New Testament. The Bible tells us the Old Testament is written for our learning, that through patience, endurance, and comfort, encouragement, we might have hope. 
Christ is our hope. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for this time tonight studying your word. Help us, Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to know what we do and why we do it and share it with others, Father, so they can also be pleasing to you. We pray, Father, that we continue to worship you in this way, Father, that one day we can worship you in heaven together. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, that's how you get into his church family. Have your sins washed away. Become a New Testament Christian, added to his church family. Acts 2, 37 to 47. Read it. It tells you what are you waiting for, Acts 22, 16. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Call upon the name of the Lord. In Acts 2, 3,000 people they were told to repent and be baptized for remission of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 did that. And were baptized that day and were added to his church family. Verse 47. So you're doing it God's way. Then when you're added to God's church family, as we live this Christian life, if you fall away, and it's not one saved, always saved, the Bible tells us when you get in that position, you can come back to him. We can pray with you and for you, James 5 and verse 16. Pray one for another that you might be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of righteous people avail much. We can do that tonight with you. We can do that anytime. Just get a hold of us. Let us baptize you. Let us pray with you. Let us help you get right with God. May God bless you and keep you.